All right, so I thought perhaps the uh, questions, the review questions, I thought we'd go over them, not, you know, in super detail, but just, um, you know, discussing them and uh, referring back to a few figures that you might find helpful. All right, so one of the first things we talked about in Chapter 13 was the natural flora. And we mentioned that the natural flora could sometimes be um, oper an opportunistic infection. Anybody remember any of those instances that we talked about? Two of them were antibiotic associated. Right, so the, um, the antibiotic associated uh, yeast infections and the antibiotic associated colitis, you'll remember, that's caused by Clostridium difficile. And then really the third example we had was of the pneumocystis girovici that is found in the um, upper respiratory tract. And people with impaired immune systems can develop forms of pneumonia caused by that. I, I, meant, the, I meant pneumocystis girovici if, if I, we've seen it a couple of times. Okay, two, differentiate between true and opportunistic pathogens. So remember, opportunistic pathogens can only cause disease in someone who is already impaired. And if you want to look at some examples of that on page 385, table 13.4, you can see some of the instances in which host defenses are weakened, and this can allow opportunistic infections to develop. So that's what we're looking at with that question. All right, three, what diseases are represent, represented by the acronym STORCH and what is the importance? So what's the importance of STORCH? Right, so these are gonna be diseases that can be transferred from mother to child either by crossing the placenta or through blood exchange during the process of birth. And so you remember the S is for syphilis, the T is for toxoplasmosis, the O is for things like hepatitis B, HIV, the R is rubella, the C is cytomegalovirus, and the H is herpes virus. All right, four, describe four ways by which microorganisms evade the immune defenses of a potential host. I really just meant three there, not four. So remember we talked about capsules that allow them to evade phagocytosis. Um, we talked about the production of leukocytins, which are literally toxins made by some organisms to kill white blood cells. And then we mentioned mimicry, where the pathogen tries to appear like one of your own cells to your immune system. Okay, then we move on to talking about some of the ways in which microorganisms cause uh, tissue damage. So remember, we talked about several exoenzymes. So mucinase digests what? Right, keratinase, keratin, right, collagenase. Right, and remember collagen is the most common protein in the entire human body. Um, and then hyaluronidase. And there was an example here on page 390 when you're looking at the exoenzymes in figure 13.5. And again, you'll see bacteria. The bacteria are releasing enzymes which are digesting the material in between the cells. Remember that material in between the cells is rich in hyaluronic acid, so hyaluronidase. All right, then we also talked about exotoxins versus endotoxins. And you have a table on page 392 that does a nice job of comparing the two. 
So remember, we were most concerned with toxicity, effects on the body, chemical composition, manner of release, and typical sources. Those were the things that we were most concerned with there. So there's a good place for you to go back and review that. All right, then we went on to talk about uh, latent infections. And remember, a latent infection is just one where there are periods of inactivity with no signs or symptoms with periods of activity with signs and symptoms. That's all we mean. And one of the good examples I gave was um, the herpes simplex 1, the, uh, the virus that causes fever blisters. Remember, when you're not actively having an outbreak, it's remaining latent in your trigeminal nerve. And then sometimes, be it UV radiation, stress, infection with another virus, it activates it, travels down the trigeminal nerve, and actually infects the epithelial tissue. So that was one of the best examples that we talked about of a latent state of a disease. What do we mean by sequelae? It's the permanent damage often left behind by an infection. So one of the examples I gave in lecture was meningitis. Many people who survive meningitis will have seizure disorders afterwards. And those seizure disorders are directly attributed to the infectious process of meningitis. Um, people can get pneumonia that permanently damages the lungs so air exchange can't can't occur. That's another example. So sequelae, permanent, you know, physiological, anatomic um, symptoms, basically, that stick around after the infection is gone. Okay, then we talked about epidemiology, and we talked about several epidemiological terms. So the first two we talked about were prevalence and incidence. And you'll remember that prevalence is just the percentage of the population that has a particular disease. So when you're talking about prevalence, you see statements like 20% of the population is infected with pathogen A. You know, that's what you hear. In incidence, remember, that was a measure of the number of new cases. And you only get, in prevalence, you're counted for as long as you have the disease. In incidence, you're counted once when you are first diagnosed. Okay, then we had some more terms, endemic, sporadic, epidemic, and pandemic. Remember we said that an endemic disease is present at a constant rate within a population over time. Sporadic means the uh, pathogen can appear, infect people, and disappear for long periods of time. And I said that a lot of the sporadic diseases we don't, seem, we don't have anymore in this country because many of the sporadic diseases are diseases that we have vaccines against. For example, diphtheria used to be a very prevalent sporadic disease. And you might have an outbreak one year and go seven or eight years without a single case of it, and then it pops up again. So that's what we mean by sporadic. Remember we said epidemic is a very loose term. We said epidemics can occur in buildings, within populations. And then pandemic was a disease that had reached basically almost all of mankind on the planet. Pan means all. So the three pandemics are malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV. Those are the three currently recognized pandemics. All right, then moving on to number nine there. Describe examples of living and non-living reservoirs and how these reservoirs play a role in transmission of disease. So you can see quite a bit of this on page 398. So remember, when we were talking about living reservoirs, let me get that up a little bit so people can see it better. All right, so 
remember with living reservoirs, we had animals. So what's a disease, what do we call a disease that affects both humans and animals? Zoonotic, correct. So animals can be a living reservoir. Humans can be living reservoirs. And remember, we use the term carrier when we're talking about humans as reservoirs. And then we had vectors. So, you know, take a look on page 398. You got some of your, you know, asymptomatic carriers, convalescent carriers, all the various types. And then remember that in the healthcare setting, the passive carrier is most important. And you have that in figure 13.9. Remember, one of the keys with the passive carrier is they are not infected. They just serve as a vehicle carrying the pathogen from point A to point B, but they are never infected. All right, then we talked about two types of vectors. We had a biological vector and a mechanical vector. And you can see examples of that as well on page 398. So a really good example in this case was the Anopheles mosquito. It is a biological vector. Um, the plasmodium, the malaria parasite that they contain, actually goes through part of its life cycle in the mosquito. Versus a housefly in which pathogens can attach to the surface of the housefly and then the housefly can leave it behind everywhere it goes, but it's not infected. The pathogen is not completing part of its life cycle in the fly. The fly is just passive carrier, really. I, and then you had your various forms of transmission on page 400. And that applies to the second part of that question. All right, 10, what is a nosocomial infection? Right, acquired in hospital or healthcare settings because we're doing so many procedures outpatient now. You sort of have to include that. Um, the, what were the three most common nosocomial infections? Yeah. Respiratory, right. So on page 402, you have a pie graph, and they're showing you the various types of nosocomial infections. So yeah, urinary tract infections, surgical site infections, and respiratory infections are the three most common nosocomial. And then, you know, just make sure you understand a passive carrier and how a passive carrier can carry the pathogen from one patient to another. Alrighty. Then let's move on to the questions for your innate immunity. So in our innate immunity, let's take a look at question one. Describe in detail the physical and chemical barriers associated with each of the following organ systems. So if we're talking about the skin, what were we talking about as far as all of this? Remember, there's the keratinized layer of cells. And remember, there's a low pH, high salt content. And then the, there are those antimicrobial secretions, remember, from your sebaceous glands. Remember, the digestive system has the various digestive enzymes as well as hydrochloric acid. And there's mucus as a barrier. Remember, with the respiratory system, we have all of those ciliated cells that help move debris and organisms out of our respiratory system. There's going to be mucus. And remember that in mucus, saliva, and tears, you have a chemical called lysozyme that's going to digest bacterial cell walls. And then the urinary system, you've got the constant flushing with urine, and that um, urine leaves a slightly acidic urethra. And remember, bacteria, for the most part, don't like to grow in acidic conditions. All right, number two is just to show you that you need to look back at your leukocytes. 
And so this question says, for each of the following cases, identify the types of leukocytes you would predict would be involved. So acute inflammation, what are going to be the two leukocytes most involved with that? Macrophages and neutrophils, correct. So you notice I said acute. A whole bunch of other white blood cells show up during chronic inflammation. But in particular there, I'm talking the, the figure I drew on the board, that is acute inflammation. Your book spends a little bit of time going more into chronic inflammation and they start having, you know, T cells show up and all this, but in our lecture, we, we concentrated on acute. All right, what are we going to find in the cortical follicles of lymph nodes? Lymphocytes, right, B cells and T cells. What white blood cell do you think would be involved in a cryptococcus infection? So the first thing there is you've got to realize what cryptococcus is. What is it? What class, I mean, what kingdom does it belong to? What is it? It's a fungus. And we talked about a white blood cell that was involved in parasitic infections, fungal and helminth infections. Which one was that? The eosinophil. So you would expect there in a cryptococcus infection to be high levels of eosinophils. All right, which leukocyte is going to be involved in hay fever? Right, basophils. Hay fever is an immediate allergy, and basophils are involved in immediate allergies. Right, in number three, in detail describe the events of acute inflammation with regards to the following. So we've talked a little bit about the cells involved. We have our neutrophils and our macrophages, but don't remember, don't remember, don't forget <laughs> that you've got um, your damaged cells, right, as well as your mast cells that are important. Do you remember in that, sh in that uh, little drawing that we did, we said that inflammation was initiated by those um, mast cells and those damaged cells. Remember, they release histamines, cytokines, in particular chemokines, and prostaglandins. So there are your chemical mediators. There's the second part. This question gets some people for some reason. So that's why I'm sort of going through step to step. Vascular effects. First off, which chemical mediator is going to cause the vascular effects? Histamines, right. And we talked about three effects. We said that um, capillaries dilate, venules constrict. And so what does that result in? Blood. Right. Real, more blood comes to the area and then it remains in the area for a longer period of time because of the venule constricting. And then also remember that those capillaries become more permeable. So cells and liquids can actually cross it more easily. So what was the general term we used for more blood, uh, an increase in blood flow to a particular area? Hyperemia, right. All right, actions of the leukocytes. So we're talking about the neutrophils and the macrophages. And remember, they both perform phagocytosis, but there's a little difference between them. Remember that the neutrophil is a phagocyte of bacteria, pretty much only, where the macrophage is going to be a phagocyte of bacteria, cell debris, damaged cells. So for inflammation to end and healing to begin, you've got to remove all of that debris and damaged tissue, and that's what your macrophages will do. And that sort of resolution as well. Clinical signs and symptoms. What are the four clinical signs and symptoms? Rubor, which is redness, calor, heat, tumor, swelling, dolor, pain. All right. And make sure you can, you can go back and tell me where these come from. Remember the rubor, the calor, and 
The tumor all have to do with the vascular effects. You got more blood to the area, so the redness. Remember, the blood is a heat reservoir, so you've got the increase in temperature. And remember that the swelling is from fluids leaving the permeable capillaries. All right, question four, explain the... Um, uh, the action of antiviral interferon. And so to take a review, take a look at that, check out page 435, figure 14.8. That's a good thing to review. So interferon was one chemical system that we talked about. The other one was called complement. And remember we said with complement, there's going to be this reaction cascade. And ultimately, we say that the uh, complement has been activated. And you remember we said there are a few things that activated complement could do. Did we not? We said it could enhance inflammation. We said it could enhance phagocytosis by uh, opsonization. And we said it could form a membrane attack complex, which is that little donut that gets stuck in cell membranes. Take a look on page 437, and you can see that. All the way down at the bottom, you can see a cell that's been punctured by these membrane, excuse me, attack complexes. All right, so that's innate. Now, let's go on down to acquired immunity. Okay, so question number one is the what we looked at today in lecture. So remember, you might want to uh, refer back to figure 15.15. That is on page 459. All right, number two, we're wanting to describe the types of antibodies, excuse me, that will um, be involved in the following cases. So you're going to be wanting to refer back to table 15.2 on page 457. So let's just take a go at these. Right, A, these are the antibodies involved in passive immunity associated with breastfeeding. IgAs, remember IgAs are the secretory antibodies and um, breast milk is a secretion. All right, B, these are the antibodies formed during the humoral response. What were the two major ones? IgM and IgG, correct. C, these are the antibodies associated with allergies, immediate allergies. IgE, remember IgEs are on the surface of basophils, and basophils mediate that, those immediate allergies. D, these are the antibodies that serve as B cell receptors. IgD, right? Um, e, these are the secretory antibodies. IgA, right? This antibody exists as a pentamer. Right, IgM. So there will probably be a section where I make several statements and you have to match it to which class of antibodies the statement applies to. All right, then we talked about those four types of acquired immunity. And that's on number three. So for each of the following cases, identify the form of acquired immunity described. So A, some patients will receive antibody infusions to aid in eliminating an infection. It's artificial, passive, right. The individual is not making the antibodies. They're coming from an outside source. All right, B, oh, no, sorry, B, uh, the tetanus vaccine is composed of an activated toxin that primes the body's immune response. Right, artificial active. 
C, breastfeeding provides maternal antibodies to the nursing child. Natural passive. And D, Andrew is no longer susceptible to the mumps virus because he had it as a child. Natural active. All righty. So if you can recognize examples like that, you're pretty fine on that. All right. Question four asks you to take a look at the technologies that we talked about in vaccine formation. All right, so look at A. The diphtheria vaccine is produced by harvesting exotoxin and treating it with formaldehyde to inactivate it. Toxoid, remember there was a particular type of subunit vaccine called the toxoid vaccine. I gave you the example of um, the tetanus vaccine. So any, anytime you see inactivated toxin, you're talking about a toxoid vaccine. All right, B, the Moki Moki vaccine is produced, which if I ever discover a disease, that's going to be its name, Moki Moki. <laughs> I have some people who will spend an hour and a half trying to find the Moki Moki vaccine. I mean, I've had a girl come to my lab just crying because she couldn't find the Moki Moki vaccine doesn't matter what I name it. Moki Moki vaccine is produced by taking the causative agent and weakening it such that it is no longer pathogenic. Attenuated. Remember, anytime you see us taking away the ability to cause disease from a virus or a bacterium, then it is attenuated. Um, C, an experimental HIV vaccine is composed of a surface antigen found on the virus. Subunit, right. Make sure that you can recognize those various um, vaccine strategies that we talked about. All right, five, describe the roles of each of the following cells involved in acquired immunity. So what's the role of the B memory cells? Long-term immunity, right? That's the source of your long-term immunity is the fact that you've got memory cells patrolling your body. What do the B plasma cells do? Right, they make the antibodies of the humoral response and so they'll be active from the first time on. All right, then we've got T cytotoxic, cytotoxic T cells. Remember we said they kill virally infected cells cancerous cells, and transplanted cells. And we said the T helper cells co-stimulate other B cells and T cells. Um, they enhance inflammation, and they release chemicals that enhances the production of leukocytes. Don't worry about suppressor or delayed because apparently they no longer exist. Used to, but not anymore. They think that both of those are actually just forms of helper T cells. So I forgot to remove that because I used to teach it that they were something. Okay, so those that's just a little commentary over the review questions so you know what you're aiming at when you're reviewing for the exam. So now we need to go down to the lab because you need to culture some of your natural flora. So if you could just, you know, you can take five minutes or so because I have to set up a little bit and then we'll perform that lab that I've given you and then we'll be probably finished for the day. We've done a lot. <laughs>